co-director of the New Plays Workshop, Jamie Rosha Allen and myself. Welcome to this evening's Zoom reading of The Misfit Arrives by Lane Richens. I want to talk a little bit about the theater department's New Plays Workshop. Uh, we nurture new plays in this workshop. We've been doing it for a number of years. I began to think uh, the other day about how, what if you went to movie theaters and the only thing that was playing there were remakes of old movies. Well, that actually happens a lot nowadays, but if that's all there was, you'd think there was something wrong with the movie business. Well, that's true in theater too. Our new plays are the lifeblood uh, of theater. And that's why we're nurturing them here in the New Plays Workshop. Here's how it works. We selected completed, unproduced scripts, uh, and then students from across the department from the actor training program, from the music theater program, from the design program, the stage management program, and the theater studies program. They all take the class and they join the workshop as a, as a class. It happens at the beginning of January. We work through the whole spring semester. Once in, uh, we form creative teams, one for each of the plays. This year, there are four plays uh, in the new plays workshop. Uh, and then we begin to work. First, one of the dramaturgs, uh, with that, that's the creative team is the, is the writer, a dramaturg, a director, in this case, a, uh, an associate director with Jamie acting as kind of lead director for all of the plays, uh, and a stage manager. The dramaturg leads us through material that's particularly important um, for whatever play we're doing. For tonight's play, uh, The Misfit Arrives, it was important that everyone familiarize themselves with a particular short story, which I'll mention in just a moment. So we do that for a while. Then we do a series of table reads where we familiarize ourselves with the scripts themselves. Then we explore the scripts on their feet. This is kind of the most exciting time, I think, the exploration where the writer gets to see for the first time their play in three dimensions as it kind of moves around. Uh, and then it might surprise some people to know that we don't actually cast these plays until quite late in the process, usually the beginning of this month. And then we cast them and rehearse them. In this case, we've been rehearsing on Zoom for a few weeks uh, to get ready for these readings. But during the exploration period, everyone plays all the parts. Gender doesn't matter. Um, and uh, suitability in some ways doesn't matter because then the writer gets to hear all kinds of voices and get all kinds of ideas. All along the way, the workshop pauses for discussion. Discussion. What, what are you hearing in the script? Observing. And then the writers rewrite as they see fit. Um, they tend to work really hard in this workshop. But what a wonderful and glorious way to work. You get your own cast of characters, own, your own acting company. The Misfit Arrives uh, fills that bill beautifully. Tonight, you'll be hearing and seeing The Misfit Arrives as its very first audience. So thank you for being at the cutting edge of theater. The play runs one hour, 15 minutes, and a brief talk back will follow immediately. So here's your mission, if you choose to accept it, to observe carefully, and in the talk back, which will be led by our dramaturg and stage manager, Victoria Wolf, who took both roles in this particular production, along with our director, Connor Mama Partridge, and our writer, Lane Richens, uh, you will observe carefully and then tell Lane what his play is about. Now, if you can't stay, that's fine too, of course. But if you can, you might be thinking about what are the two stories that get told in this play? How do those two stories interact with each other? What thematically does the play say to you? Victoria will guide you, and she has questions of her own. You can ask questions in the chat. So after the play's over, you can type in questions, and they'll go in the chat. Or you can just unmute yourself and ask the question orally. I want to thank this hardworking creative team and cast, and especially Lane, who, in the best of ways, was never satisfied with a really good script until it became a great one and worked on it throughout the process, including yesterday. Lane Richens is a true theater professional. He's worked as an actor, a writer, and a director for 25 years. He has a truly refined and powerful theatrical vision, as I've discovered this year. He thinks theatrically. He knows what works on stage, what it will look like, what it will sound like, what stories work dramatically, and how to craft them. 
As with our two previous playwrights, last night and the night before, Jane Moyce and Ben Stanford, Lane is a recipient of a Promising Playwrights Award scholarship. Lane's play tonight, The Misfit Arrives, is about one of the most celebrated mid-20th century fiction writers, Flannery O'Connor. Well, actually, Mary Flannery O'Connor. You'll see why that being her full name is important as you watch the play. The play focuses on O'Connor's most celebrated short story, A Good Man is Hard to Find, and about events that happened because she wrote it. But Lane also takes us inside the story itself, and his play treats time fluidly. In less deft hands, that might get confusing, but Lane's theatrical skill doesn't let that happen, so don't worry. He takes us on a thrilling journey in time and place and the human heart. Now, once again, please keep your videos off and yourself muted for the entirety of the performance. For optimal viewing, turn your presentation to gallery view. That's in the upper right-hand corner. Is that where I'm pointing? You can hide non-video participants by clicking the three dots over any non-video box and clicking the option labeled hide non-video participants. Enjoy the show, and we'll see you in the talk back. The Misfit Arrives by Lane Richens. Cast in order of appearance, Regina Klein O'Connor also plays the grandmother, age 68. Flannery O'Connor also plays Mama as Flannery, ages 39 and 16, as Mama, age 39. Edward Francis O'Connor also plays Bailey, age 45. John Wesley, age 10. Young Flannery also plays June Starr as Young Flannery, age five, as June Starr, age eight. The Misfit, age not applicable. Notes, all props are mined, um, mined unless otherwise noted. The crutches are a costume, not a prop. Flannery does not read from a book she recites. The lectern is imagined. Mama's baby is imagined. The Misfit's henchmen are imagined. The stage should be bare aside from five chairs. These chairs should be used any time furniture is called for, including the car. This may not be noted in the stage directions. Flannery should use her crutches in every scene except when she is 16 in the scenes in the story within the story. Spring 1964, lights up on Regina Klein O'Connor, 68, at home, seated in reading a letter. Flannery O'Connor, 39, enters on crutches and moving with difficulty. She sits across from her mother as at a table. She is fatigued, though she is trying to exhibit a sunny personality. What's that? Regina quickly sets the letter on the table, covering it with her hands. Ugh, oh, it's nothing. Nothing. <laughs> no, what is it? Is it bad news? Mr. Friel called this morning. We need to go down to the store to pick up your medications. They put Mary back on the prescription labels. Mary Flannery O'Connor, as it should be. After breakfast, we'll go get you dressed and go on down there. Maybe we'll pick up some fried chicken and mashed potatoes for lunch. It's important you get your nutrients. These days are getting harder on you. Guess who I ran into in town the other day? Philip Grover. I ran into him at Friel's when I was picking up new pads for your crutches. My, he is still handsome after all these years. We used to go together, you know, before your father. God rest his soul. We had such adventures. Only the types of things young people discovering love for the first time would do. Ice cream socials, football games, rallies. It never progressed past a good friendship. We never even kissed. I may have married him, though, if I hadn't met your father. But when you meet a man like your father, you must dedicate your life to him. A man like that does not come around but once in a lifetime. <sighs> a good man is hard to find. I hold hope you may find such a man someday. It pains me to think you probably will not. <sighs> How are you this morning? Having a hard time? Y you were chafed yesterday. Is that getting worse? Maybe we should take a bath before we go into town. Your right leg seems to be having a difficult time lately. We'll do your exercises. We need to keep on top of those. What's in that letter? Mary, I told you not to worry about it. You only go on with these recitations when you're trying to hide something. That's not true and you know it. 
I had a dream. Another nightmare? Oh, my girl. I guess at some point the psyche can't protect you from your physical limitations. It wasn't a nightmare. This is the nightmare. I know, honey. But we'll make progress. New exercises, new medications. That's not what I mean. What do you mean? Mother, I'm so bored. That's what's eating at you. Boredom? It's eating away at my soul. All I do is sit around. Get up, come to breakfast, sit around. Get up, take a bath, sit around. Sit around in the car, sit around at lunch, sit around at dinner. You know, since I moved back here, I've put on 20 pounds. All I do is eat. Sit and eat and write one hour a day. Thank God I have that, even though I have to sit to do it. I know, honey. But I'm not sure what else we can do. You're so sick. It's true. I am sick. I am dying. But I'm not dead yet. I can still do things. I'm not as weak as you think. I want to do things. I want to go places. And when I get there, I don't want to sit around. I know. I'm not an invalid. Please don't paint me as your jailer. I do feel I am imprisoned sometimes. I have to depend on you for so much. I couldn't get through a day without you. You help me with everything. That is a mother's duty and privilege. It makes me angry. It works in theory, but it doesn't work in practice. Making me so reliant on you strips me of my freedom. You certainly don't have to be reliant on me. You have options. I'm sorry. You know I'm grateful. And I'm not angry at you. A little at you. I'm angry at the situation. I'm angry that I have to put you in a position to fulfill your duty. I'm angry my body is angry at me. I'm 39. It's not supposed to be this way. I want my life back. Regina hands Flannery the letter. Flannery reads it. Were you going to show this to me? I don't know. We're going. Mary. Mother. We can't do this. It's not practical and it's not safe. I wasn't intending to hide it from you. I, I didn't know what to do with it. This is next week. How long have you had this? Not too long. Since Monday. It's Friday. I know. And it's been a horrible responsibility keeping this secret. I have read it every day, wondering what to do. There's no question about what to do. Smith College is 1,100 miles away. Good thing we have a week to get there. <sighs> Weren't you listening to what I was saying? This is our chance! Let's live a little. No jailer, no prison. Let's make a break for it. Plus, they want to give me a doctorate degree. That's pretty incredible. Honorable. Honorary doctorate. Yes, it is quite the distinction. Make you think more of yourself than you already do. Mother, an honor like this isn't just an honor for me. It's an honor for you. It's an honor for our family. I'm flattered. Let's go. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Fine. Fine. We'll <laughs> go. You and your incessant badgering. Always since you were a child. Okay, but on my terms. Name it. We give ourselves six days. Three there, three back. We take our time. We stay near the cities in case we need to get to a hospital, taking care not to go through the cities themselves for fear of car wrecks and stress. Now, here's the route. Regina produces a map. We'll obviously go north, skirting Raleigh, going through Washington, D.C., and Baltimore, sliding by Philadelphia and New York, we're not going to get too close to either of those cities, danger. Then, up to Northampton. You planned this whole trip. You knew we were going. I'm still your mother, Mary. The most important thing is keeping you calm and relaxed, and staying near places we can pull over. Anytime there's any issue at all, we pull over. We're going to take the whole thing slow and easy. Thy will be done. We'll have a great time. It'll be fun. You'll see. I guess I will. 
Blackout. We move to summer 1930. Lights up on Edward Francis O'Connor, 45, seated on the lawn outside. He watches young Flannery, five, run in and out of the light as she plays with the chicken. Regina crosses to Edward. It's amazing the endless amusement she gains from chasing that old chicken. Not every child teach a chicken to run backwards. You have a point. Flannery, leave that chicken alone and come on over here. I want to talk with you. What is it, Daddy? Come on over here. Edward pats his knee and young Flannery sits. Why do you have to torture that chicken? I'll go get some lemonade. Regina exits. I can't help it. He's so funny. He runs backwards. Yes, yes, he does. I don't know how you taught him that. By torturing him, Daddy. What's your name? Mary Flannery O'Connor. And where do you live? 207 East Charleston Street, Savannah, Georgia. And when is your birthday? March 25th. And how old are you? Five. Good job, my little peacock. Well, let's try something a little harder. How do you spell dairy? D-A-I-R-Y. Very good, Mary. And what does dairy make us think of? Moo. Moo, that's right. Now, can you spell peach? P E. A C H. And what's the peach? The state fruit of Georgia. It is, isn't it? What is two times two? Dunno. Come on, we've gone over this, and don't say dunno. I don't know. I don't care. Excuse me? What? What did you just say? I said, I don't care, Daddy. I don't like multiplications. Mary Flannery O'Connor, let me tell you something. I don't like them either. And I don't think you should do them again until you are older. What do you think of that? I think that sounds great. Good. Good. You know why I try to teach you so much? Why? Because I want you to be prepared. It's not easy being a woman these days. I don't want anything standing in your way. Okay. Now, let's go get that chicken. Young Flannery chases off after the chicken. Edward follows, carrying his chair. Regina enters with lemonade. What's all the racket out here? Blackout. We return to spring 1964. Flannery has arrived at Smith College and is about to give her acceptance speech. Lights up on Flannery as she walks to the lectern, using crutches and moving with great diff difficulty. Over the sound system, we hear, A living legend! A true inspiration! Flannery O'Connor! When Flannery hears this, she stops walking and looks up to the sky as if something has dawned on her. She continues to the lectern. Regina sits in one of the downstage corners. Also seated is the misfit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please, please have a seat. Thank you. You flatter me. <laughs> Hello, females of Smith College. I would like to begin by saying what an honor it is to be joining you here today. When I found out Smith College wanted to bestow this distinction upon me, I was utterly astonished. I did, and at a, such an esteemed institution, I am humbled. Smith College, with its long-standing commitment to the advancement of women's rights and women's strengths, is the sort of place where opportunity is created and dreams are made realities. You know, President Conway has graciously asked me to read for you my, I suppose, defining work. A good man is hard to find. Thank you. <laughs> I believe I am going to get right to it. Maybe say a few things afterwards? Is that okay with you? Okay. A good man is hard to find. Edward enters as the character Bailey in the story, A Good Man is Hard to Find. He builds the car out of five chairs during the narration. Flannery sets her crutches to the side and moves to the car as she narrates. June Starr, eight, enters and is played by the same actress who plays young Flannery. John Wesley, 10, follows closely behind chasing her. 
Regina has become the grandmother. It was sticky that day, the kind of day you swam through. Days like these were suffocating, but they did wonders for your skin. The scent of eucalyptus was in the air. Some days it carries a fresh, bright scent, somewhat like a mint julep. This day it carried a sterile medicinal scent, somewhat like mentholatum. The, oriole, the orchard oriole migrates through here this time of year. They even take over a tree right over there, that old sycamore. The grandmother thought they were beautiful birds. Goddamn birds? Bailey didn't like them because they defecated on his car. Flannery becomes Mama, swaddling a baby. Bailey, I don't know why you insist on going to Florida. Look, just you look at the newspaper right here on the front page. Here this fellow calls himself the misfit is loose from the pen and headed directly for Florida. And right here, Bailey, you read what he did to these people? I wouldn't take my children anywhere near Florida with a criminal like that on the loose. How could I forgive myself? What do you care? You don't have anything to say about it. If you want to go back to Florida, why don't you stay home? Are you kidding? She wouldn't miss coming if she could be queen for a day. Oh, yes. And what exactly would you do if this misfit fellow caught you? What would you do then? I'd punch him in the mouth. She wouldn't stay home for a million bucks. Just for that, I'm not curling your hair anymore. My hair is naturally curly. Do you see, Bailey? This is how you raised your children. Do you hear what they are saying? This is how they talk to their grandmother. Bailey continues to pack the car, paying no attention. The kids play around the car. The grandmother turns to Mama, swaddling the baby. The children have been to Florida before. You ought to broaden their horizons. Take them somewhere new. Let them see the world. They have never been to East Tennessee. She looks at the baby in Mama's arms. May I hold her? Please let me hold her. What a sweet and quiet girl. Mama hands her the baby. The baby starts crying. She hands the baby back to Mama. All right, let's get ready to go. Everyone gets into the car. Bailey drives with Mama and baby in the passenger seat. The grandmother is in the center of the back seat with John Wesley and June Starr flanking her on either side. Let's play a game. Look here. We're leaving Atlanta at 8.45 a.m. And do you see? The mileage on the car is 55890. Remember that, children. 55890. Now, let's see what the mileage is when we get back. That's not a game. Why are you dressed like that? What do you mean? Like you're going to a funeral? Well, we can't all wear t-shirts and dungarees. <laughs> it's important for a lady to dress well when she travels. You should always wear white gloves. You should always wear a wide-brimmed hat. You should always wear lace. And you should always be adorned with a flower of some kind. I prefer violets. Do you see here? But it's hot. A lady must make sacrifices. Suppose someone found you dead on the side of the road. How would you like them to think of you? I wouldn't care. I'd be dead. If someone found me dead on the side of the road, I'd punch him in the mouth. <laughs> well, I always want to present myself as a lady. Bailey, the speed limit is 55. Patrolmen hide behind billboards and clumps of trees, and they'll speed right out after you before you have a chance to slow down. Mother. Children. Make sure you pay attention to the details of the scenery as we drive by. You'll see Stone Mountain. Along the road, you'll see blue granite that juts up on both sides. Great banks of red clay streaked with purple. The tree is so streaked with silver sunlight, the gnarliest of them sparkles. Yes, we are fortunate to live in such a beautiful place. Let's go through Georgia fast. We don't have to look at it much. If I were a little boy, I wouldn't talk about my native state that way. Tennessee has the mountains and Georgia has the hills. Tennessee is just a hillbilly dumping ground. And Georgia is a lousy state, too. You said it. In my time, children were more respectful of their native states and their parents and everything else. People did right then. 
Look at the cemetery. That was the old family burial ground. It belonged to the plantation. Where's the plantation? <laughs> Gone with the wind. <laughs> Gone with the wind. Blackout. In the black, Bailey, June Starr, and John Wesley exit. We return to spring 1964. We see Flannery and Regina seated in the car, having embarked upon their road trip. Mother, you haven't said a word since we left Savannah. We are in South Carolina. Will you please talk to me? I'm sure you feel right proud of yourself, being made a doctor, sorry, honorary doctor. It's an incredible distinction. I'm sure it is an incredible distinction. The great Flannery O'Connor. Mother. The great Flannery O'Connor, God's gift to the short story. Oh, God. Even her sentences are short. Always this with you. I'm sorry. What am I hearing? Always what with me? Just... We're going to be in the same car together for a long time. If you have something to say, you may as well say it. I know you. You'll be unhappy either way. I just don't like feeling like I'm being punished for my success. <laughs> punished for your success? Unbelievable. What does that mean? Nothing. Nothing. I... Everything is always about you. Everything. That's not true. Mary always gets her way. Or oh, Flannery. Sorry. I don't always get my way. Famous for writing 30-page stories. I could do that. Receiving doctorates she hasn't earned. Fawned on by critics and intellectuals. Given a fa fatal disease. Losing self-reliance. Dying a virgin. <sighs> Do you remember fun? Mother, you've given us three days. Isn't there anything along the way you'd like to see? Anything you would like to do? We can't stray from our route. We can do whatever we want. I feel better than I have in weeks. Come on, can this be where the fun starts? Let's forget about the award and the world and the rules and just... Mount Airy is only a few hours off the route. Let's go. Where's Mount Airy? Northern North Carolina. Great. Let's do it. I don't know. You always do this. Bring up an idea and waffle on it. Let's take a chance. You've obviously thought about it. We would see some beautiful parts of our country along the way. Okay. Let's go. But... We pull over whenever you want. Got it. Mount Airy, here we come. Also, what's in Mount Airy? It's only the birthplace of one of America's most iconic stage and screen stars. Really? Who? One Mr. Andy Griffith. Andy Griffith. That's right. Iconic? Well, I suppose not so as iconic as Dr. Flannery O'Connor. I'm not iconic. You're not a doctor either. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm excited. I want you to know how much I appreciate you taking this trip with me. I really am only looking out for your own good. Mary, this year marks the 23rd anniversary of your father's death. Since then, you've been all I have. And I've been all you have for a long time. I'm scared of losing you. I know you're scared. Truth be told, I'm a little scared too. But we can't get ahead of ourselves. Who knows? I, I might outlive you. That was in poor taste. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> I apologize. And I'm worried about navigating my life after you're gone. A woman shouldn't outlive her husband and her child. It's not natural. I understand what you were saying. These are scary things to think about. And sad. And sad. What about this? What if we just enjoy every minute of this trip? What if we have the best time of our lives? Then when we get home, we can deal with these issues. Because I just, I do, I feel so sad for you. Misfit crosses the stage unacknowledged.
Mount Airy is only four hours away. We'll get there in time to tour the town. Andy Griffith, I'm your new biggest fan. <laughs> Blackout. In the black, the family resumes their places in the car. Lights up. The afternoon did not bring any relief from the morning. It was still wet. They had finished peanut butter and marmalade sandwiches. The children preferred theirs without marmalade. The grandmother did not think that was a sandwich at all. Her hope was that the lunch would calm the children. The reality was the antithesis. They were restless and in an argument over clouds. Flannery becomes mama. It's a cow. No, it's an automobile. Cow. Car. They slap fight at each other over the grandmother. Stop it, children. Stop. Stop. They stop. It's a cow. Have I ever told you the story about Dole Ellard and the watermelon? Who knows? We tell a lot of stories. Stories are a blessing, children. You never stop telling them. When I was a younger woman. A hundred years ago. When I was a coquettish young maid, I used to be quartered by a Mr. Edgar Atkins Tea Garden of the Jasper Tea Gardens. My, he was attractive. He had a shock of blonde hair and striking blue eyes, sparkling sapphires. Oh, but he was so enamored with me. I was very desirable in those days. Well, every Saturday afternoon, Mr. Mr. Edgar Atkins Tea Garden would bring me a watermelon with his initials carved in it. Now, one Saturday, Mr. Tea Garden came calling and nobody was home. So he left the watermelon on the porch and returned in his buggy to Jasper. However, when I arrived home, the only thing on the porch was the rind. Now, Dull Ellard was a simple boy. He was the son of our maid, Elvira. He was a sweet enough boy, but he wasn't completely present. After some investigation, I uncovered that Dull Ellard had stumbled across the watermelon that afternoon, and after seeing the initials E-A-T carved in the side, he ate the whole thing. <laughs> That story is no good. And what do you mean by that? I wouldn't marry a man just because he brought me a watermelon on Saturdays. I'll have you know I would have done well to marry Mr. Tea Garden. He bought stock in Coca-Cola when it first came out and only died a few years ago. A very wealthy man. The grandmother begins to nod off, catching herself as she would begin to snore, then nodding off again. Finally, she does not catch herself. John Wesley and June Star begin to pile things on top of her as she sleeps. Whatever they can get their hands on. A book, her purse, etc. Kids, leave your grandmother alone. Let her sleep. Yes, for God's sake, let her sleep. The children take the things off the grandmother. None of this has faced her as she continues to snore. After some time, John Wesley and June Star conspire to aggressively elbow her on both sides. The grandmother's scream startles Bailey and Mama, causing them to scream as well. Oh. Ah. Damn it, you kids! Please, the baby. Mother, are you all right? Well, I must declare I'm a bit shaken. Children, apologize to your grandmother. Sorry. It was just a prank. Blackout. In the black... Bailey and June Star and John Wesley exit. Spring 1964. Lights up on Regina and Flannery in the car as their road trip resumes. Looking forward to the ceremony? I don't think it's really going to be a ceremony. Sure it will. You're going to be a doctor. I imagine it will be a very humble solemnization. No, not for you. Mother. Not for Flannery O'Connor. Won't even use your full God-given name. And for what reason is this great honor being bestowed upon you? What do you mean? What is it you've done that's so great, so deserving? Betray your people like backwoods rubes? Characterize your home as some kind of hillbilly house of horrors? And to what end? I know to what end. You aren't even grateful. 
You denigrate the character of the people and the land of the South, and you can't even be bothered to thank them while you reap the rewards. Flannery makes a pain sound. Ah, ah. What is it? Are you okay? I'm fine. I'll pull over. You don't need to pull over. I'm fine. Do you need your pain medication? I'll pull over and get it. It's just in the trunk. I'm fine. Really? Do you see? This is what I mean. Ungrateful. Treat your mother like you treat the South. Okay. Pull over. Your terms. Blackout. Spring, 1940. Lights up on Edward, 40, and Regina, 43. Walking in their home garden. Regina holds Edward's arm. Edward is on crutches and walks with difficulty. We need to remember to pick up those dungarees from Friol's. Yours are so threadbare, you can practically see through them. I don't need new dungarees. These are just fine. And it's time for a haircut. I'll give you one this evening. I don't need a haircut. You look a sight. If I didn't know better, I might think you were a vagrant. Look at those shoes. How do I let you leave the house dressed in this manner? You on my arm, I'm the best dressed guy in the world. <laughs> Why, Edward Fitzgerald, you charmer. I'm going to miss you, you know. Miss me? Where am I going? You shouldn't say such things. You're not going to, we're not going to be leaving each other anytime soon. Look, an Oriole. Henry is going to have a hard time. She's going to need your help. She's going to be fine. Look at that. What a pretty bird. I'm more worried about you. I do not like this line of conversation. You're going to need help too. Edward, I'll be fine. Why must you insist on continuing? Please, I'm dying. Let's talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. Try not to be too hard on Flynn. You're going to need her someday. She'll be fine. Honey. Why would you put me in this position? It's a special kind of cruelty to make a woman talk of her dying husband. I understand the difficulty, but I need to. I need to be at peace before I go. You need to be at peace. I will never be at peace. If you leave me on this earth alone, I will never find peace. You have Flannery. I don't have Flannery. She's going to finish school, and then she'll be gone, too. And neither of you are coming back. She will come back, and we want her to leave the nest. There are great things awaiting her. She'll forget all about me. Or worse, she'll pretend like she's forgotten all about me. She's not the type to forget her roots. Or pretend to. Edward. I... Yes? Will you hate me when I say I'm afraid I resent her? I resent her already. Don't go building houses on quicksand. You may need to feel that way right now, and I understand what you're saying, but that's our little girl. Don't resent her. That's your little girl. Since the day she was born, you've only had room for one girl in your life. I got shoved out like I sh shoved her out. In ways, that was the worst day of my life. You're jealous? Of course I'm jealous. The man I knew went away that day, became somebody else, and now the man he became is going to leave me as well. I don't know what to say. Oh, there's nothing to say. Things are what they are. I hope you can reconcile this once I'm gone. The only way I could reconcile this, Edward, is if she went instead of you. Oh, that's a horrible thing to say. I can't talk about your death anymore. I don't have the strength for it. It's going to happen, talk about it or not. And go go tend to the geese or something. Look! There's an Oriole. No, please don't go. I'm sorry. Edward exits. The misfit crosses the stage unnoticed. 
Every time I turn around, you're leaving me. Blackout. Spring 1960. It is four years before the road trip to Smith College. Lights up on Flannery seated on the ground between Regina's legs, having her hair braided. You have such pretty hair. So shiny. You were always so pretty. I don't feel very pretty these days. I don't even feel like a woman. Every boy in school clamored for your affections. No, mother. Every boy in your school clamored for your affections. Oh, there weren't so many. Every boy in my school pretended I didn't exist. And in every school since. They were just intimidated by your mind. Great. All I want is a date. And they're all afraid of me because I can form a complete sentence. <laughs> Men will always be intimidated by an intelligent woman. They have bred us for so long to know our place and to be subservient that now we are coming into our own. They can't make heads or tails of it. It puts them in a state of confusion, which makes them defensive and hostile. It's fight or flight. Animal instinct. I don't like thinking that I'm shunned, shunned because I have a brain. That is making me into a new kind of prey. It's the way of things. You're smart. Daddy didn't ever seem to treat you like these men treat me. Mary, I've never been as smart as you. You are gifted and unique. Tell me a story about Daddy. You're 35 years old. I think you've heard every story I've got. Tell me the one where- Your father was always a romantic. We were married on a Saturday. After the very modest service, he picked me up, put me in his trunk, truck, and off we went to Florida on our honeymoon. It was July and the air was heavy with dew. We departed Savannah around two o'clock and were in Crystal River by eight. Do you know what a manatee is? No. What is it? I know you've heard the story a hundred times, but I'm going to tell you what it is anyway. It's a great sea fish. It's a mammal? Always have to know everything. Yes, a mammal. And it has an impressive mustache, which reminded your father of Fuller Brush. <laughs> they are large, majestic animals. You could tell they were one of the creator's favorites. Well, while we did stay two nights with the great dugongs of Crystal River... They're not exactly the same. Your father had chosen Florida because he knew some people in Homosassa. The last morning of our stay in Crystal River, we took in the manatees one more time. After a while, I mentioned we should probably be on our way to see his family. And without missing a beat, he said, Why? Well, didn't, didn't we just see them? <laughs> <laughs> we spent the rest of our honeymoon lazily making our way back home, taking any side route we wanted, stopping at every stand, taking in every small town. It took us a week to come home 300 miles. It was the best week of my life. Do you miss him? Do I miss him? Does a woman miss her youth? But we talk every day and I feel him walking next to me. May I admit something? Of course. I am shamed by this, but sometimes I have a hard time remembering what he looked like. I have to look at photographs to remind myself. I know I was 16 when he was taken, but somehow I still forget things. Does that make me a horrible person? A person ought not to be ashamed of something they can't control. Do you think Dadley would think less of me if he knew? Your father never loved a thing in his life more than you. I mean that. Not me, not his own mama. I know beyond a shadow, there is nothing you could do, nothing, that would make your father think less of you. Nothing you could do. Nothing you could do. Blackout. In the black, the family resumes their places in the car. Lights up. I know this area. How surprising. I visited a neighborhood here once when I was younger. You don't have to keep saying when I was younger. Everything in the world happened when you were younger. This house had six white columns across the front. There was an avenue of oaks leading up to it and two little trellis arbors on either side in front. This is where you would sit with your suitor after an evening stroll in the garden. 
I was there in the spring and it was so refreshing. I would not forget that place for the rest of my days. Bailey, I know you're not much for side trips, but couldn't we take one small detour? It isn't 20 minutes from the road. I don't ask for much. No. As I recall, there is a secret panel in this house. The story is that all the family silver was hidden in it when Sherman came through, but it was never found. Hey, let's go see it. We'll find it. We'll poke all the woodwork out and find it. Who lives there? What do you turn off at? Hey, Pop, can we turn off there? No. We have never seen a house with a secret panel. Let's go to the house with a secret panel. Hey, Pop, can't we go see the house with a secret panel? It's not far from here, I know. It wouldn't take over 20 minutes. No. We want to see the house with the secret panel. Take us to the house with the secret panel. We never have any fun, not even on vacation. Why can't we ever do what we want to do? The children begin raising hell. They keep going on about the house with the secret panel and kicking the backs of their parents' chairs until finally... All right! Bailey brings the car to a stop. Will you all shut up? We all shut up for just one second. If you don't shut up, we won't go anywhere. Bailey, temper. It would be very educational for them. All right, but get this. This is the only time we're going to stop for anything like this. The one and only time. The dirt road you have to turn down is just about a mile back. I marked it as we passed. There was the most beautiful glass over the front doorway. I believe it was a representation of Jesus Christ in stained glass. Yes, I'm sure of it. It was glorious children, and they had the most elegant candle lamp in the hall. I bet the secret panel is in the fireplace. Can't go inside this house. You don't even know who lives there. While everyone is talking out front, I'll sneak around the back and get into a window. We'll stay in the car. He turns down the dirt road. This better not take long. It'll be worth it, Bailey. I promise. How far down this road did you say it is? It's not very well maintained. Not 20 minutes. See something familiar? Say something. He turns back to face her. What am I talking about? How about this? When you see something familiar, don't say something. Then I'll know we're there. Blackout. Summer 1928. Lights up. We join Virginia, 32, and Edward, 33, sitting on the lawn outside the family home, talking. Edward, you really ought to keep a closer eye on her. Fine. She's three. She's supposed to be playing around. How have you been lately, honey? Getting by as usual. You seem a little dark lately. Do I? It seems like it to me. You're right. I don't know. I can't shake it. Is it something specific? No, not that I can tell. I just feel this oppressive heaviness. I understand. I'm, I'm here for you. I just have this feeling something very bad is going to happen. I feel like it's going to be a major event. Well, no one can tell the future. Yes. Correct as usual. It'll get better soon. I'm past the valley. Florence Perkins' services on Sunday, don't forget. What church again? Sacred Heart. Three? Four. Oh, that's great. Uh, Grover and I should be back from the lake by then. Mary, be careful. Well, she'll be fine, Regina. We've got this under control. Nothing to happen to her anyway. Peach might fall on her head. Edward. Do you think we'll ever talk about us? What do you mean? I mean having a conversation about our relationship. I... Every time I bring it up, you shut it down. Dear Edward, do you think we'll ever talk? We haven't been intimate in months. I know. 
I... And that's okay. That's okay. I can live without that. I can live without it if we can figure out what's going on with our relationship. Why do you have such a hard time talking about it? I just don't like to. Well, I'm going to need you to sometime. We can't keep going on like this. I'll try. I'll keep trying. Edward, you say that, but you never do that. I think I do. I, I feel like I do. Well, I don't see it. Flannery, get down from that tree. You know you're supposed to stay on the ground. I'll try harder. Okay. I love you. I love you too. We need to figure this out. Uh, get over and check on the cows. Check on the cows. Yes, they... There is a loud scream. Flannery? Flannery! Oh my god! I told you, goddammit! I told you! Go call the doctor! Edward exits. Regina exits the opposite way. Blackout. In the black, the chairs making up the car are turned on their side. We hear an incredibly loud pop of a blown tire. This sound and lights up should happen simultaneously. Lights up on Flannery at the Smith College lectern in the car within the story. They had blown a tire and hit a bump in the road, causing the car to veer into a ditch. The grandmother had a terrible thought moments before. The house with the secret door was indeed in Tennessee, not in Georgia, where they still found themselves. They would never make Florida. The grandmother decided not to mention her realization. Mama had broken her collarbone, but had protected the baby. Bailey had a slight concussion. The family exited the car. Mother sat on the side of the road with the baby. Bailey looked at the tire. The children ran, a car, ran, the children ran around the car excitedly. We've had it's an accident. accident. We have had an accident. accident. Yeah, but nobody's dead. In the distance, the grandmother saw a car, black and long like a hearse. She waved her arms frantically, trying to catch the car's attention. To her relief, the car came towards them in a cloud of dust. Blackout, summer 1941. Lights up, Regina, 44, stands next to Edward, 45, who is frail and sits with crutches nearby. Maybe I... Flannery, come on over here. A 16-year-old Flannery enters. Edward pats his knee. Addie, I'm 16. And? I think I'm a little old to sit on your knee. And that is a true and great shame. <laughs> I'll settle for a hug. Flannery gives him a hug. I'll go get some lemonade. Regina exits. Flann, do you remember what I've taught you about picking peaches? How could I forget? You've been teaching it to me since I was five years old. Well, let's go through it once. Humor your old man. First. First, you smell. The air should be full of that sweet scent. Breathe deep. Take it in. Delicious. Second. Second, you look. Make sure there isn't any green. The perfect peach should have a field of deep orange blushed with garnet red. It should look like an embarrassed sunset. Third. Third, you touch. If it's hard at all, leave it where it is. It should give just a little under the weight of your thumb. Just a little. Any more than that, and it's starting to get overripe. And? Fourth, you taste. <laughs> Naturally saving the best for last. <laughs> How are you doing? Is everything right in your world? Any boys I need to have a stern talk with? I wish. Well, don't worry. They'll come, and I'll chase them off. And I'm doing fine. I worry about you. How are you? Oh, don't you worry about me. You go ahead and you take, put that idea out of your mind. Okay. Flannery, it's time we talk. I know. Flann? I'm going to die soon. I don't know when. It's going to be soon. I've already made it longer than the doctors thought. But there are a few things I want to make sure I tell you. One, you are the love of my life. The day you were born, I was so happy. I thought I would die from joy. You were amazing. So small, so fragile, so pink. 
I just couldn't believe that something so perfect could even exist. You're daddy's girl from moment one. I still am. Some things never change. So, your mother is going to have a real hard time. You're going to go off to school and she's going to be left here alone. Please, don't mistake me. You have to go to school, Flan. You need to see the world and then follow your dreams. You still have greatness coming your way. But you need to go out and get it. Do that. But try to remember your mother every now and then. She's really going to need your help getting through this. I mean, she'll be fine. She's a strong woman. But it'll be much easier with your help. She's a good woman. She's been a pure and giving wife and friend all these years. You're going to be able to hear her heart break in half. And what will I do when I need help? Well, I'll be there. Just pick a peach. This is really hard for me to talk about, Daddy. I know. I understand. We don't need to discuss it any further. I needed to make sure you knew those things, but you're strong. There is one more thing, Flan. I... This is the hard part. You know I'm dying of lupus, right? But what I don't think you know is I... Flan, I, I don't know how to say this. I have lupus and it's genetic and, and you could get it and you should get tested and I'm sorry I haven't talked to you about it sooner. This is no picnic and you should be aware. Well, that's a lot to take in. It's a lot, but it's okay. I can take it. That's not something you should worry about right now. I wasn't keeping a secret plan out of any sort of malice. You need to know that. I didn't know how to tell you, and I didn't want to until the time was right. Obviously, I failed on both accounts. Daddy, you have never failed me. Would you like to talk about it? You know, honestly, I'd rather you and I pick a few peaches. Looks like pretty good picking out there. The best there is. That sounds great. Let's do it. Edward struggles to get out of his chair and to get his crutches under him. Let me help you. No, I have it. I'm all right. Thank you, sweetheart. Why don't you go on up ahead? I'll wait here for your mother to get back with the lemonade. Then I'll come meet you. Okay. I love you, Flannery. I love you too, Daddy. Flannery exits towards one of the wings as Edward watches. The misfit enters and crosses to Edward. They both exit upstage. Regina returns with lemonade. She is alone. Blackout. In the black, the chairs are turned over. Flannery moves back to the lectern at Smith College and watches the action. Lights up. Bailey! Bailey, look! Help is coming! Stop flailing your arms like a goddamn clown! It's your fault we are in this mess. Look at your daughter. I think she's broken her shoulder. I swear you are lucky the children are hurt. Or by the time that car gets here, you'd be dead by my hand. I may remind you it is because of my clownish waving that help is on the way. How am I supposed to be held at fault for a blown tire? You may as well blame the children. The amplified sound of a car on gravel is heard. The car stopped nearby, and for some minutes, the driver looked at the car with an expressionless gaze. Two men exited the back seat of the hearse-like car. One wore black trousers with a silver stallion emblazoned on the front. The other wore khaki pants and a blue-striped coat with a gray hat pulled low, hiding most of his face. After a moment, the driver exited the car. He seemed to be in charge. He was shirtless and wore jeans too tight for him. His hair was graying at the edges. He wore horned-rimmed glasses that gave him the appearance of a scholar. The grandmother had a nagging feeling she knew this man. He approached the family. Good afternoon. I see you all had a little spill. We've had an, had an accident. Let's see what we can do about that. Hiram, try the car and see if it will run. What you got that gun for? What are you going to do with that gun? 
Lady, he turns to Flannery, who is still at the lectern. Lines are blurring. Lady, would you mind calling them children to come sit by you? Children make me nervous. I want you all to stick together right now where you're at. What are you telling us what to do for? Come over here, children. Look here now. We're in a predicament. We're in... You're the misfit. You're the misfit. I recognized you at once. Yes, um, but it would have been better for all of you, lady, if you hadn't recognized me. Bailey turned his head sharply and said something to the grandmother that shocked even the children. The grandmother began to cry. Lady, don't you get upset. Sometimes a man says things he don't mean. I don't reckon he meant to talk to you that way. You wouldn't shoot a lady, would you? I would sure hate to have to. Listen, I know you're a good man. You don't look a bit like you have common blood. Yes, I'm finest people in the world. God never made a finer woman than my mother, and my daddy's heart was pure gold. Watch them children, Bobby Lee. You know how children make me nervous. Listen, you shouldn't call yourself the misfit because I know you're a good man at heart. I can just look at you and tell. Hush! Hush! Everybody just shut up and let me handle this. Bobby Lee, why don't you get him and the little boy to step on you yonder with you? The boys want to ask you something. Would you mind stepping back into those woods there with them? Listen, we're in a terrible predicament. Nobody realizes that this is... The one called Hiram pulled Bailey up by the arm, as if assisting an old man. John Wesley grabbed his father's hand as Hiram led them to the woods. Bobby Lee followed. Bailey, you come back this instant. The grandmother called for Bailey in a tragic voice, but found she was looking at the misfit. I just know you're a good man. You're not a bit common. No, I ain't a good man. But I ain't the worst in the world either. My daddy used to say I was a different breed of dog. Where are they taking him? You could be good if you tried. Think how wonderful, wonderful it would be to settle down and live a comfortable life and not have to think about chasing you all the time. Lady, somebody is always chasing you. Blackout. We return to the road trip. Flannery and Regina have stopped at a hotel for the night. Lights up on Flannery and Regina in the hotel room with two chairs. Regina is drinking peach schnapps. <laughs> I can't remember the last time I had so much fun. Who knew? <laughs> Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Something new every day. Well, I knew. I'd read about it and I knew it was true. And this after Mount Airy? I'm glad we're able to do some things you enjoy. One of the best railroad museums in the country. It was impressive. And I did not know Jim Thorpe was called the Switzerland of America. Because of its natural beauty and striking architecture. Andy Griffith one day, Switzerland the next. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to do about dinner? Well, it's three o'clock. I'll have you know three o'clock is a very sensible hour for the evening meal. Yeah, if you're 80. Watch it. You're not anywhere near 80. I thought I'd relax for a couple hours. Maybe we can decide about dinner then? Whatever you want. Okay. Kisses mama on the cheek. Thanks for this. It's exactly what I needed. Let's go home then. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a great idea. You're so funny. I'm not trying to be funny. What do you mean? Just that. We did it. We went on a trip. You just said yourself it was exactly what you needed, so... Let's go home. We're not going home. Why not? We're doing this for a reason. Yes, and I thought that reason was you wanted your life back. Isn't that what you said? You were tired of sitting around. Mother. Great. We've done two days of not sitting around. You've had fun, haven't you? Yes, I have had fun. Then let's go home. We don't need to stay up here any longer. There are many fun things we can see on the way home, too. Don Knotts' hometown is in Morgantown, West Virginia. That's not too far away from here at all. What is it with you and the Andy Griffith show? It's wholesome television with a good message. We're still going. Oh, of course we're still going. It has been decreed by the Queen herself. What else shall we do, Her Majesty? What has gotten into you? Listen to me. I'm being frank with you now. We're in the North now. What year do you think this is? You aren't protected by the Shroud of the South up here. 
you can't, you can hide from things in Savannah, but up here, the gloves are off. Oh, are they? How very pugilistic of the North. You aren't listening to me. You have taken everything real and right about the South and turned it into a mean-spirited, mocking spectacle of freaks and morons and criminals. Now we're heading to a university who wants to honor you for writing these very stories. The stories that parodied the people of the South. You are from the South, Mary. You are one of those people. We have been through this. And here we are anyway. We'll see if this does anything for you. They're not just making fun of Flannery O'Connor, the Southerner. They're making, they're making fun of Flannery O'Connor. You ever thought of that? Where were the clamoring crowds before you got sick, Mary? Stop it. Yeah, I don't remember any newspaper articles. I hadn't written anything yet. You'd written things. You know, it makes me laugh. The irony is completely lost on you. The fame you've made exploiting the South wouldn't have even happened if people weren't exploiting your illness. They don't care about you, never have. You're a novelty act. They'll keep asking you back because what's more entertaining than a clown that doesn't know she's being funny? Aren't you tired of the world looking at you like a clown? You're nothing to them. They'll trot you out and call you an inspiration, but don't fool yourself. You're just another freak from the South. Stop. Will you just stop? Listen to yourself. I'm your daughter. <laughs> they want to give me a yes, honorary doctorate degree. I want to be there to receive it. Now, I know you didn't want to go on this trip. I know you must feel like you didn't have a choice. I... You should be happy for me. Happy for you? I'm sick of being happy for you. Sick of being happy for either one of us. You're right. I didn't want to go on this trip, and I do feel like I had no choice. And yet, held hostage, turned traitor, made complicit in your fame. Why do you hate me, Mary? I don't hate you. You can't hide what's in plain print. I've read A Good Man is Hard to Find. Maybe you haven't. I don't recommend it. That story has nothing to do with you. Oh no? The grandmother? May as well have named her Regina. Though, I'll never know the joys of grandchildren. Can you ever make a point without being cruel? The story isn't about you. It was never about you or the South or making my people hicks. Mother, I wrote this when I was 30. Do you remember what happened when I was 30? That was the year you moved back home. You know, it broke my heart. A woman shouldn't have to move home again. It was also the end of my life expectancy after my diagnosis. You were given five years to live. I'd already seen Daddy die of this. I was... I didn't know what to do. I was terrified all the time. <laughs> I'd returned home to rely upon my mother as a caretaker. I was upside down. So I wrote this story. It's about death. And I wasn't sure how to work that out. But I was dealing with some serious existential angst. So I wrote a story about people on a road trip and the indiscriminate nature of death. But why do you make them so unlikable? The grandmother is a shrew. You're not supposed to like them. The minute you gain affection for them, the balance of life and death get tipped, and the black and white nature of death takes on color. Also, they're just people. Not every person is likable. Had I not written this story when I did, I'm not so sure I'd be here right now. I might have to give it another read. With a husband down and a daughter to go, maybe I'll relate this time around. I miss your father, Mary. I know you do. I can't express to you the pain, the incredible sadness. The outward grief of having lost my husband and the inward grief of knowing 
my daughter had lost her father. I wasn't a good mother for a lot of those years. You were hurting. I was hurting. I was. I'm, I'm still hurting. But I was adrift. I never thought I'd feel that kind of pain again. Just the sheer loss. It got better. But then you got your diagnosis and I felt like I was at your daddy's funeral all over again. Hard to imagine depths lower than I felt. But I know they are there. And I know I'm going to feel them when you die. We're still going. I know where we're going. But you're the one who's going to have to remember where she's been. Plenary exits. Blackout. In the black, we hear the startling, loud, and exaggerated sound of a pistol shot. This sound should sound distinct from the tire blowout. Lights up. Flannery has her turn to the lectern. The grandmother is on her knees with the misfit looking over. There was a pistol shot from the woods. The grandmother shuddered violently at each shot, as though she was being shot herself. She could hear the wind tops like a long, satisfied insuck of breath. Bing! Are you a religious man? Did, did you ever pray? No, never put much stock in it. I was a gospel singer, though. I've been most everything. Been in the armed service, both land and sea, at home and abroad. Been twice married, been in a tornado, seen a man burnt alive once. He looked at the children's mother and the little girl. I even seen a woman flogged. Pray, 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 pray. I never was a bad boy that I can think of, but somewhere along the line, things went wrong and I got sent to the penitentiary. That's when you should have started to pray. Turn to the right, it was a wall. Turn to the left, it was a wall. Look down, it was a floor. Look up, it was a ceiling. Not much room for God there. Well, what did you do to get sent there? Maybe it was a mistake. No, sort no mistake. If you prayed, Jesus would help you. Well, ma'am, I reckon that's true. Well, then why don't you pray? I don't want no help. Lady, would you and that little girl like to step off yonder with Bobby Lee and Hiram to join your husband? Help that lady, Hiram. And Bobby Lee, you, you hold that little girl's hand. Alone with the misfit, the grandmother found that she had lost her voice. She found herself saying, Jesus! Jesus! She was calling to him for help, but it sounded as though she was cursing. Yes, ma'am. Jesus thrown everything off balance. It was the same case with him as with me, only he hadn't committed no crime. Does it seem right to you, lady, that one is punished a heap and another not at all? Jesus, you've got good blood! I know you wouldn't shoot a lady. I know you come from good people. You've got good blood. Pray! Jesus, I'll give you all the money I've got! Lady, there never was a body that gave the undertaker a tip. There were two more pistol reports, and the grandmother raised her head like a parched old turkey hen crying for water. No! No! If one were close enough to her, they could hear her heart break. Looks like it's your time. No. Jesus, no. I'll take care of you. Like you were my own child. I'll pray for you. I'll pray to Jesus for your soul. Lady... It's time to fess up to yourself. There ain't no Jesus can help you. There's only you and me. I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. Only one of us walking out of here. I know. Seems like no rhyme or reason. Random. I guess none of us really get to know what's gonna happen till it does, and then it's too late. Blackout. In the black, the chairs making up the car are stricken, aside for the one Regina sits in during Flannery's speech. Lights up on Flannery and Regina in the same positions as they were at the beginning of the play. The misfit shot her three times in the chest. Hiram and Bobby Lee returned from the woods and stood over the grandmother, who half sat, half lay in a puddle of blood with her legs crossed under her like a child's and her face smiling up at the cloudless sky. Without his glasses, the misfit's eyes were red-rimmed and pale and defenseless looking. He was tired. Take her and throw her where you've thrown the others. Some fun, huh? Said Bobby Lee. Shut up, Bobby Lee. It's no real pleasure in life. The end. 
On occasion, someone will ask why I write such gruesome characters. In the past, my answer has been something along the lines of anything one doesn't understand is gruesome, or it's the reader who is the gruesome one. How arrogant can you get, right? <laughs> the truth is, I do write gruesome characters. And in doing so, it is the writer who is truly the gruesome one. I have struggled with how to deal with death for a long time. My father died when I was 16. I was diagnosed with lupus at 25. Same disease that took him. It's going to take me soon, too. In grappling with death and writing this story about it, I failed to see what was helping me was hurting others. What I saw as a reflection of the randomness and finality of death was to others a severe critique of a land and people that I hold dear. It means everything to my family. Hear me say, the South is the greatest place on earth and is populated with people as close to God as you can get. I hope those offended can find it within them to forgive me. I ask for it. I traveled here with my mother, Regina. That's her right over there. Hi, mother. <laughs> We've had a great trip. I learned a lot about her. We went to the home of Andy Griffith in Mount Airy, North Carolina. She's a huge fan. And the Railroad Museum in Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania. I had no idea she even liked trains. I don't like my mother a lot of the time, and I rarely agree with her. She's demanding. She's controlling. She's irascible. These sound like the complaints of a teenager living in her mother's roof. But since my diagnosis, that's exactly what I've been doing. She became my caretaker. There isn't a person on this planet who cares about my well-being more than my mother. There isn't a person who loves me more either. We were talking about some things last night that got me thinking about life, about reality. Is perception all reality really is? I thought about Plato's allegory of the cave. Welcome out of the cave, my friend. It's a bit colder out here, but the stars are just as beautiful. All day that quote has been going through my head. Welcome out of the cave. Last night, she told me some things. Some I had heard a hundred times, some I had heard for the first time. But I was hearing all of them as though the thoughts were virginal, new. And they pissed me off. They really did. She knows how to infuriate me, and I went to bed fuming. I had a horrible night's sleep, and not just because she was snoring. Sorry, Mama. And all day I've been angry. Even as I took the stage tonight, I was still a little mad. And as I walked to the lectern, in a moment, I realized why I was really mad. She was right. <laughs> I'll be damned. She'd been right all along. So, with due respect to President Conway, Smith College, and you, I am declining this diploma and this honor. It should go to someone else. I'm going home. There was a brief pause as Flannery stares into the audience. Suddenly, Regina leaps to her feet and claps enthusiastically. The misfit joins Flannery on stage. Regina watches as they exit arm in arm, leaving her once again alone. A moment, then blackout, end of play. Okay, I wanna give that a minute for that to, to sink in. Uh, uh, now, if um, I can be joined, uh, I'm seeing people say, clap, clap, clap. Great job, everyone. <laughs> if I can, um, so Lane, if you will uh, join me on Zoom stage and uh, also um, Victoria and Connor. And I'm only here as a kind of fail safe. Uh, so Victoria, let me turn the time over to you. Sounds good. Um, my Wi-Fi is being really bad, so if I cut out, Tim is why he's here. Um, I would just like to say thank you all for being here and listening. If you can stay for this talk back, that'd be phenomenal. Um, Lane is the playwright on here, and Connor, who thankfully played our John Wesley tonight, is also the, the director. Um, I would like to start by asking some questions to Lane. 
So what inspired you to write this play? Uh, I um, was drawn to this uh, short story, uh, you know, in high school a long time ago. And um, I had read several other short story authors, uh, but this one kind of stuck with me and I've wanted to turn it into a play for maybe 20 years and haven't figured out a way to do it until I started to wonder whether I could portray a story of Flannery O'Connor that would be a good companion um, to that story um, and one that would sort of intertwine with that story. And that became my goal. How has being able to work in this workshop with the play affected your writing, both on this piece and also how do you think it'll affect your future writings? Uh, I mean, it, it's just constant work. It's just constant rewriting. Watching it again tonight, um, I have a, at least two pages full of notes that I need to go back and fix. Um, and that's probably the best, that's the best uh, benefit from the class because you get the opportunity for people to tell you when it sucks. Well, thank you. Um, Connor, a few questions for you as well. Uh, what did you learn about directing this reading or from directing it? Um, I think the biggest takeaway for me is, you know, I, I'm, I'm training in the acting program, so I don't have a lot of behind the scenes. So it was really interesting to kind of be on the other role and uh, approach the actors and the scenes, how you know I would approach it, but also to coordinate and work with those actors to not just give them a certain acting style to apply to the show, but also to work around their acting styles and their strengths. That way, you know, I don't want to mold them into a certain thing. They're they're evolved play for a reason. They can mold themselves. I'm not I'm not the only sculptor here. So I think getting to work with actors on the other side was probably the, the most significant takeaway I had from it. Nice. Um, how did your ideas of this play shift as you were working on it and directing it? Well, uh, each rewrite by Elaine definitely shifted a couple things. But um, no, honestly, I think from the initial reading, um, I didn't really know how I wanted to approach the show. And then once we started getting it up on its feet with the first couple of read-throughs, with uh, like physical read-throughs we did in class, that really helped me kind of create that world, honestly. Um, and then just the, the initial casting. So I think it, the way that I kind of built the world in my head was just the, the, the nice progression. I mean, Lane did add a lot of scenes and take out a lot of scenes, but he didn't change the story. The story was always the same. Um, and so it was nice because I had that picture in my head and there were just things getting added into it. And Lane, had, Lane did the beautiful job of uh, diving deeper into that world and flushing it out a lot more, both the characters and literally just the landscape of the world. I mean, I think one of the characters itself is the is uh, the locations because of how important those are to the story. Yeah, very nice. Um, I wanna make sure the audience knows you can type questions into the chat as we're all talking right now and any questions, comments, anything like that. Uh, the first comment we have that I'd like to read out says, I like that the play is surprisingly more about Regina than Flannery. I think Regina is the, is the most complex and I think Regina is the most complex and revealing. Enjoyed much. Um, so yes, I have some questions now for the audience. If you guys would like to turn off your mics or just answer in the question or in the chat, that'd be great. Um, we are looking for observations, not necessarily judgments of quality. So after seeing this play for the first time, um, what's it about or what ideas from it struck you and really stuck with you? Come on, audience, don't make me sit here in silence. While you're all thinking about that, I'll say a second comment we had. Uh, great play, great actors. I was brought to tears. Relatable for all mothers and daughters. The fear of losing loved ones is universal. How was it to change between stories? I guess that works for some of our actors. If you're still on here and want to answer. Yeah, Simona, go for it. Yeah, and Lexi just hopped on too. Um, it was really, it's really kind of interesting because uh, obviously, like the switches are so quick um, that really you just kind of have like as soon as your camera goes off, you're like, oh, new character, oh, new character, oh, new character. 
Um, but even with that, it was still it was still kind of fun, especially like like Edward and Bailey aren't super similar characters, I would say. Like obviously uh Bailey is very has such a short temper, and Edward's kind of, you know, he's he's such a nice dad. Um, so even in that, it just it just makes it fun, I guess, to have like that different kind of range with the two different characters. But thank you, Lexi. Yeah, um, I think like specifically speaking to Flannery and Mama, Lane did this great thing in the end where the lines kind of start to blur and the story kind of turns into the reality of the situation. And with Mama and Flannery, it was kind of really fun to kind of blend those characters almost or have moments where I jumped right from Flannery, like right into Mama and back and forth. And it was uh, really fun to play with as, as an actor. Good, thank you. Um, someone did answer the first question I posed to the audience. They said this is a play about loss of loved ones and also mother-daughter relationships. Those are things that really stuck out. Um, I know one person commented on Regina. Are there any other characters that really um, were compelling for you? Why or why not? You can feel free to turn on your mics if you want. I'm hesitant to turn on my mic because I I have read the different drafts of Lane's play. Um, you know, in the I I was absent a few times, so I missed out on getting to workshop it in person. But I I something that I really love about Lane's play is uh, you see very vividly the different ways that people listen to one another and the layers that Regina and um, Flannery have of like listening to one another and how that seriously gets in the way of their communication. Um, and you see that throughout too, like you see it grow. And then, and I, and I remember at the beginning, I was like, why are they so bad at talking to one another? And uh, then I, it just gets, it gets so much more clear. I don't know if that's going to add at all to the conversation, but it was, it's just so lovely. Yeah. So lovely. Thank you. Um, uh, Aaron, I see you say the misfits compelling. Do you want to elaborate? Oh, I see right here. I can read it out loud. It made me think quite a bit about how honestly anyone can answer when asked if their writing is auto autobiographical. Whoa, autobiographical. There we go. Yeah, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, no, I, 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 I don't know. I think uh, in the original short story, you know, I just I, I thought a lot about um, like the notion of sort of being trapped in narrative um, and uh, and how hard it is to um, see. Uh, the forces that are holding us in place in our sort of uh, trajectory, you know, as characters and as people, uh, it, there was a question of whether, you know, the grandmother character and Flannery's mother were uh, the same person essentially. And I don't know if it would be possible for a writer to actually answer honestly when confronted with questions like that. Uh, I also had a question by the way too. Uh, I, I might've missed this because uh, to be completely honest, uh, uh, I did have to step away for a sec, but um, did I, did I hear a, was there a Joyce Carol Oates reference in there in the dialogue? We're getting a no from Lane. Sorry. Okay. Well, that's something I got from the- What are you uh, referring to? Yeah, from the script. Pardon me? What are you referring to, pal? Oh, uh, there's the, um, the, the line from uh, Flannery's mother. Uh, there's the, the Joyce Carol Oates uh, short story, uh, Where Are You Going, Where Have You Been? Oh, yeah, um, no. Anyhow, that, that connected for me too. I don't know. I, I, I'm going to go away and let uh, give some space to other people, but thank you so much. Sorry, sorry. I, I didn't quite get what you were saying at first, um, but yeah, no, um, but hi. <laughs> Hello, lady. <laughs> um, I have a, not com oh, a comment to read out. The relationship between Flannery and her father was so warm and supporting. That drove some of Regina's jealousy, grief, anger, but she held onto her duties as a mother. So much texture. 
Um, one last question for the audience members to give us feedback on. As Lane goes and reworks this play and writes new parts to it, changes things, what is one thing for you guys that he needs to keep in there that absolutely needs to stay in, in your opinion, of course? Also, what are the 10 things that need to go? <laughs> Lane, stay positive about your piece. People are loving it. I'm open to additions as well. I'm so Ellie, sorry. Oh, M, what'd you say? Sorry, would you mind repeating the question, Victoria? Yes, absolutely. Um, so as Lane does reworks on this, what are some things you think he absolutely needs to say or things absolutely needs to go? Elise and Alexis are saying no changes. Anyone else in the audience? have things on my mind i just don't want to like i've been a part of this conversation so i don't want i want, I want someone else to talk here we got a couple uh, of comments uh aaron says the audio parallel between the gunshot and tire blowout has to stay agreed uh jessica says i wanted to see more regina edward and young flannery uh not sure if it is necessary but i enjoyed those bits a lot um there is there has been Ted. There has been development, Jessica, on a couple of scenes, one of which sort of addresses what I think you're looking for. Lane, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, okay. Uh, I've is known Lane. I've known Lane since he was a little boy, uh, and. Uh, I wanted to tell you, Lane, how much I've seen you grow in writing this play. I remember watching you as a teenager and then watching you as a young man and, and now as a more mature man. And I, I loved the way that you brought the two together. And I, I, I liked the way that you have grown as a man to understand women a little bit better. Uh, that play, the play reminded me of how hard it is to raise a daughter if you're a man, but what must it be like to raise a daughter if you're a woman? When you share the same hormones and the same ideas and the same feelings and love the same person, but get jealous over them. I thought you did a really nice job there, Lane. And, and I don't know what I would tell you to take out or say, but as far as I'm concerned, a story is never over. We just, it's like Chekhov. We just walk out sometime. So I don't know what I would add. A couple other comments I'll read out. Um, absolutely love the double casting. I think it really helps ground the scene shifts. Uh, keep all Andy Griffith Griffith references, all of them. Um, and then Lexi said, you did a wonderful job writing female characters. Hey, and this, this may be a, a writer's secret, so you may not want to reveal this. I'm gonna ask the question anyway. All right. When Regina, claps at the end of the play is she clapping because she loves the story and understands it finally or is she clapping because her daughter turned down the honorary doctorate yeah so um it's the latter she's she's clapping because that moment's happened the daughter has turned down the document her daughter has made a decision flannery that rather than rather to accept the the um, diploma, she's going to go ahead and walk off with the misfit instead. But um, Regina has been left with like a, the the happiest moment she could get from Flannery as Flannery walks out the door. So it is her applauding. It's that it's the it's the turning down of the diploma that drives her to her feet. And then it's watching her go, knowing that she gave her the best moment she could give her before she went. That's beautiful. I, it brings up another thing. I think other people have said it in a, in a different way, but I'll say it in this way. Um, the, the way you make us know that the misfit is death um, with all its irrationality and its, and its cruelty um, is, 
is beautiful. I, I think it, 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 it functions as a, a commentary on the story. It's just great. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. How'd you know it was me? <laughs> Another comment in here um, says they agreed with the loving of the double casting and the inclusion of humor. Thanks, I sent that one. Thanks to all of you who are sending this. Aaron, you sweet, sweet soul. Do we have any other comments or questions for the creative team or Lane or Connor, do you guys have anything for the audience? Lane, I, I thought there were two misfits in this story. And it's interesting. But one would be a man and one would be a woman. Uh, I mean, yeah, there may be more than that. Yeah, well, certainly it is, isn't it? Because the girl herself is, yeah. Um, okay, Victoria, is there anything else? Uh, no, we just got a congratulations on your success. And I can't wait to see where you go from here. Thank you. I think that's it. If been um, a, a great ride this uh, semester. Thanks to everyone in the course and um, in part of the cast and crew of this reading for everything they've done to help that happen. Thanks to Jamie and thanks to Tim, who's been on this journey for a few months with me now, as has the, the uh, class of advanced playwriting 4420, I think. All my pals there. So anyway, thanks a lot. Thank you all for coming. I think if we're done, then we can all leave and this meeting. <laughs>